So here's the question for today. Where have you changed your ideas about God? Where did you have thoughts about God that were childish or immature or wrong or don't fit your understanding of life, scripture? Where have you changed your ideas of God or, or where do you think that you might need to? I'm in Lewis and Clark country right now and Stephen Ambrose wrote a great uh, biography of their trip, Undaunted Courage, and he talks about how when they reach the West Coast, they're staying at Cape Disappointment in Washington. Clark, who was the better cartographer of the two, spent three days and put down on paper a map of all that they knew. And he said, for the first time, the American West had become accessible. It was now possible to navigate reality. And I think there are other parts of our lives that need maps than just land. It would have been great if they could have mapped the humanity of Native Americans and how their destiny might be impacted by what was happening in the same way that they were able to map out mountains and streams and trails. And most particularly, it makes me think about our map of God and life and reality. And really, Lou Smeads, with this book that we're journeying through together, uh, is doing that. Lou's very honest and uh, uh, very forthright about the fact that he often found God to be an elusive character. And yet the book is called My God and I, not just I, not even just God and I, My God and I. And a lot of the chapters are laid out to describe his experience. God and I at Muskegon High, God and I at Smead Steel, God and I at Moody Bible, God and I at Calvin College. He is trying to map his journey through life with God and get down to the foundation of what does he really believe? Where are the mountains and the rivers that you can count on? Who is this God? And there are two places in particular, very moving, where Lou writes about having to change his ideas about God. And I wanted to tell you about them and tell you about how they have impacted me and invite you to think about, are there areas in your life where you got an old map that doesn't fit anymore and you need to change your understanding, your ideas, your beliefs about who God is? He writes one of them that happened uh, relatively earlier on in his and Doris's marriage. About four years into their time when he was teaching at Calvin, he writes, Doris gave birth to a beautiful baby boy who died before he had lived the whole of a day. God's face has never looked the same to me since, he writes. And then he talks about how in the early days of his intellectual convictions about Christianity, God's face had had the unmovable serenity of an absolute sovereign, absolutely in control of absolutely everything, every good thing, every bad thing, every triumph, every tragedy, from the fall of every sparrow to the ascent of every rocket, everything was under his silent, strange, and secretive control. But I could not believe that God was in control of our child's dying. He talks about how earlier on in his Christian life, he'd been intellectually excited by Calvin's, what he calls tough-minded belief that all things, he really meant all of them, including the ghastly and horrible, happen when and how and where they happen precisely because God decreed them to happen. A horrific decree, it was called. But if it works out to God's glory, who are we to complain? On the day our baby boy died, I knew that I could never again believe that God had arranged for our tiny child to die before he had hardly begun to live, any more than I could believe that we would one fine day when he would make it all plain, praise God that it had happened. I learned that I do not have the right stuff for such hard-boiled theology. I am no more able to believe that God micromanages the death of little children than I am able to believe that God was macromanaging Hitler's Holocaust. With one morning's wrenching intuition, I knew that my portrait of God would have to be repainted. And I wonder if there's any areas where suffering causes you to think, I gotta repaint my portrait of God. I know for me, part of what's happened in the last couple of years is that uh, pain and suffering make it much more clear than life in what might be called normal times do, that God is the only alternative to despair and despair is wrong. Despair would be not just a bad way to live, but a wrong way to live. For me to tell a little child, doesn't matter what you do with your life, would be not only evil, but it would be inaccurate. 
And I find that the thought that God suffers along with us, that that's part of the message of the cross, that somehow in some mysterious way, I can join in the fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus, that if I bring my sufferings to him, I can meet him at a deeper place than I would be able to otherwise. So there is always meaning in the suffering and the pain that I'm going through. That has become a precious thing to me and part of my map of God and life through the valleys of suffering and darkness and pain that don't have to be the valleys of despair. Um, that's been a way that I've had to redraw my map. And I'm wondering how suffering might do that for you. In a similar way, Lou talks about an episode in his life some years later when there was also suffering, but it opened him up to believing in God's supernatural healing presence in a new way. He came from a tradition where there wasn't talk about that uh, much talk about that aspect of God. Then he went to teach at Fuller. There were these classes on signs and wonders and miraculous events that Lou was actually asked to give theological reflection to. It's quite an amazing journey. And he did that in a remarkable way. And he talks about an experience that he had on that journey. Five or six years after coming to Fuller, I fell into a depression that made my family's life a misery turned me into a grouch with my colleagues, made a hash of my relationship with God, and pushed me deep into a dark night of the soul. My experience was, from start to finish, a viper's tangle of resentment towards colleagues, daily lacerations of my own self, a mystery to my family, and a hellish sense that God had abandoned me. And he talks about, in the darkness of that time, coming to believe that he didn't have the kind of faith or the kind of holiness or the kind of integrity that ought to allow somebody to preach. And so for a period of time, he stopped preaching altogether. I did not know where God was during this time. I only knew that wherever he was, he was not with me. God came back to me at the very moment I had reached ground zero in my own hopelessness. I had been living alone for a couple of weeks as a therapeutic regimen in a secluded cabin on one of the islands in Puget Sound, cut off from all my usual escape from reality. No radio, no TV, no books, no magazines that would give me a little escape from my pain. On Tuesday afternoon of the third week, while I was pacing the living room floor, I seemed to hear the voices of everyone whose approval I had lived for. My friends, my family, especially my mother, each of them came to me in turn, and each of them said the same thing. I cannot help you. I felt as if I were sinking into the ocean with an arm's reach of a boat full of loved ones who put their arms around their chests and shook their heads as I went down. Then God came back. He broke through my terror and said, I will never let you fall. I will always hold you up. When I heard him speak, remember Lou doesn't use this language lightly, or as some of my friends say, imagine that I heard him speak. I felt as if I had been lifted from a black pit straight up into joy. Never before had I been so suddenly released from the devil of despair. Never before had I known such an amazing grace. Never before such elation. I have not been neurotically depressed since that day. Though I must, to be honest, tell you, that God also comes to me each morning and offers me a 20 milligram capsule of Prozac. With this medication, he clears the garbage that accumulates in the canals of my brain overnight and gives me a chance to get a fresh morning start. I swallow every capsule with a gratitude to God. Almost makes it sound like it's communion. So, how is your map of God? what needs to be redrawn. Take a little Prozac, get to work. Worship God with a community this weekend. Be honest with him, and I'll see you tomorrow.